Teaching sustainable development is notoriously difficult. It's a huge and wide-ranging topic which affects every aspect of our lives. Such a diverse subject is impossible to teach in isolation, so many teachers choose to focus on one aspect at a time. So, how will a bar of chocolate and a packet of biscuits help these children from a school in Cumbria to understand fair trade, one of the central themes of sustainable development? This is a good lesson. Dowdale's very own Mr Geography and Mr Citizenship have joined forces and found an innovative way of teaching their Year 9s. Mr Geography, aka Matt Barton, recently won outstanding new teacher in the North East in Cumbria. Sustainable development for me is um, how local actions have a massive impact on a global scale. Um, so how we meet the current needs of the present generation without compromising that of the future generations. One of the things that's specifically relevant to where I teach sustainable development is how I get it across to kids that have no wider sort of experience of different cultures in different parts of the world, being sort of in a 30 mile cul-de-sac as it's called, the Dalton Infernus. It's really difficult to find um, really good case studies or examples for sustainable development. Obviously you can't visit the site, you can't visit the area, so to get all that information and pack it all into a small amount of time is really, really difficult. Now, like last lesson, to conquer this difficulty, Matt outlined plans for a joint scheme of work with the citizenship department, as it is a topic they both cover in Year 9. Martin Ellison is a citizenship teacher, so what are the advantages of teaching in this unique way? So me and Martin are really great mates outside of school, so we were chatting one night in the pub about the cross-curricular nature between citizenship and geography, and just thought we could you know, develop a really good joint scheme of work. We work out how different subject areas could cover sustainable development issues within lessons. So for example, when we've been examining fair trade recently from a citizenship perspective, I will consider what the individual pupils could do by buying a bar of chocolate within um, a supermarket, how that could have a, a global impact. Um, then we'll perhaps look at um, pressure groups and how they can raise awareness about issues surrounding fair trade. Obviously from a geography perspective, I'm looking at the workings of the global market. How buying a product in one country is going to have implications for people, companies in other countries as well. Okay. So, first of all I'd like to gauge some opinion with you, what you think fair trade and sustainable development means. Max and Spencer's um, take like fair trade in, but they'll raise the price, so then they get enough money and still they're giving the fair trade people enough money. Superb, yeah. Now, just moving away from fair trade, no focusing on fair trade, but does anyone have a clue what sustainable development means? Yes. And um, you can keep on doing it over and over again. Keep on doing it over and over again, all right? So, if sustainable development means <laughs> that you can keep, take what we need from the world now, yeah? We can meet the needs of the current generation as new guys and myself, but for future generations, we can keep producing these like goods, such as cocoa beans and fair trade produce, for you know future generations. You're talking 100, 200 years down the line. So the objective from today's lesson is to gain an understanding of the way in which international trade affects four families in different countries. So looking kind at of differences of the chocolate trade within countries of different families. Okay. Chocolate game is a great game to identify the links between that and sustainable development. It's like the lights being switched on with the kids where they suddenly grasp the, the fact that local actions can have global effects. Brazil. The class gets divided up into a certain number of families and four different countries. Roughly, there's going to be three families per country. Four dice are issued, one per country, and the main family in control of the cocoa trade in that country is in control of the dice. This shows how power is distributed within that country through the cocoa trade. So within your countries, guys, what you're going to do is work out which family has got the most income and who has got the least income. You've got a bar of fair trade chocolate. You need to try and work out how to divide this chocolate up so that it represents the income for the different people. So, for example, the UK here, we've got the Fovingtons who'd have like quite a substantial amount of bar of chocolate. The Hinchcliffs, they'd have quite a reasonable amount as well. And unfortunately for the Woods, they'd have very little of the fair trade chocolate, wouldn't they? Yeah? So I'd like you to unwrap it. At this point I say, please do not eat this. Yeah? All right, so one person who you can trust. Open it, and you need to quickly divide it up amongst your tables. Ah, uh, hi, this is 150. Oh, 
I can smell it. <laughs> okay, so uh, I reckon it'd work out. You'd get about four, we'd get about three, and they'd get about two, maybe. Then they'd get more. Yeah. I say we get the whole lot. <laughs> what you're spending and what you're spending on. For each family within each country is issued with an options card. This options card relates to what they can spend their income on and obviously it's specific to that country because things obviously will cost different amounts and there'll be different options available between like the UK, Ghana, Brazil and Belize. Season 1 cards are issued which obviously allows them to work out how much their income is then work out what their expenditure is going to be. Season 2 card relates to a rise in cocoa prices and how their income has been affected for the next year. So first of all, we'll start with the Fotheringtons. Come and have your new income, please, very quickly. Our income, 500. What did you spend of that this year? 288. You only spent 288? Yeah. Well, heck, you've got a bit tight with your money out, yeah? So what's your new balance? 749. 749, so you've got a lot of savings. What, what sort of things did you spend it on? Went up from um, buying some clothes in the town that people would normally wear to a quality tailor. Fantastic, so getting the clothes custom made for the sale, guys, I'd love to have that done. And then right. we've got our own plane. Plane? As well yeah. as a limo. As well so you've got a, a plane limo. as well as a limousine? Look at that. So, read the season three card, see the effect it has on your family. The season three card is actually the opposite of this, so the actual price of cocoa falls and what implications this has for their family. Moving on to the De Silva family then, very quickly. How does their lives compare? We've got a one-roomed house. We don't have any clothes. <laughs> <laughs> so you decided to be naturist of you. <laughs> Quite an economical decision there, James, alright. <laughs> uh, we gather wood for fuel and we hitch a lift. Fantastic. And then we don't have any leisure. Okay, so if you compare their standard to the family next to them, you can see a massive difference within the wealth and then how it's distributed within that country. To find case studies for sustainable development is really, really difficult and I have to rely upon like, the things that are in textbooks which can come outdated, not relevant. So I turned like, my attention to the websites and one website in particular that I found really useful was the Oxfam website. And this has everything you can think of to cover the sustainable development topics. Who would like to make their opinion on how you think it would be being in these people's positions, all the cards around the world? You can't look forward to anything because they might be sacked and that's the only thing that's going to happen to them. So you can't really look forward to anything good going in your life. To inform people about sustainable development without being partisan is quite a difficult thing to do. You need to obviously engage them in um, open debate. However, there are going to be generalisations, there are going to be stereotypes and possibly comments of a racist, unintended racist nature. And that's where you need to step in remove any stereotypes, Fantastic. remove any generalisations and put them for sort of right. But it's very much a way so the kids can work it out for themselves. Yeah. So, do you think that this is right, that this should happen in the world that we live in nowadays? Yes or no? No? So we're pretty much against it, aren't we? Right? One of the most fun ways to stimulate debate about sustainable development is to get them to interpret cartoons. You ask it what its main message is, is it getting this message across, why is it trying to do this, is there any bias within it? And then it sort of stimulates the debate to lead on from there. With the lesson nearly over, the students are given a reward for all their hard work. Fair trade in this lesson. I want it dividing up fairly, please, between different people. To connect pupils to sustainable development inside and outside the school, I think you know, it comes back to the local and global effects. So in terms of fair trade, what you can do locally, as in on your school site, and how this would affect the wider community. Superb lesson, guys. Really, really, really well done. Come up with some very, very interesting viewpoints there. Next lesson, guys, Mr Ellison will be looking at and tying in with this from a citizenship angle, what you can do as a citizen to promote fair trade and how this can have massive implications, not only for yourselves, but people's quality of life, standard of living in different countries. I'm trying to make sure that pupils can understand that fair trade is linked to sustainable development by ensuring that they get an awareness that by carrying out a local action it can have a global impact. So by doing something as simple as choosing a different biscuit within the, within the corner shop, that that can change the lives of um, people within developing countries. 
Okay, guys. Um, today we're having a look at consumer responsibilities, all right? So by the end of today's lesson, we're going to have a look, do the following, hopefully. You're going to examine what consumer responsibilities are. So we're going to think about what those two words mean. Then we're going to um, think about how our consumer choices impact on people within other countries. In today's lesson, I started off by um, examining what influences us when we decide to buy something within a shop. So the pupils considered what they bought over the last month, and then they thought about, well, did they buy that product because of the price of it, because of the brand of it, and so on. I'd provided the pupils with some chocolate and orange biscuits. One of them was fair trade. They didn't know which one, and they did a taste testing of three different biscuits, and at first they made a choice about which biscuit they would buy solely on taste and on appearance. The circular one with the fancy chocolate decoration on the top. Right, what made that one the best one for you? Well, it tastes nice, and, actually, and also it was attractive. It caught my eye. All right, so the appearance was good and that had an impact, made you feel that it was a good biscuit, Oliver. I gradually okay, gave them I'm extra snippets of information about the biscuit so that they found out that biscuit A was fair trade, that biscuit B was um, organic, that biscuit C was made locally, and we discussed about how those pieces of information could impact upon the decision they made when they went into a shop and decided which biscuit they would buy. I like biscuit A now because um, it's fair trade and it helps farmers, even though it's like the oranges are fun, like on the other side of the world and stuff. Because biscuit C, the one that, that was the one I liked first, um, like that made these are made around, around this area, and like we're already like rich enough, where like other people are. Okay, thank you. Then we had a discussion um, about the benefits of fair trade and whether the pupils felt that they could make a difference just by picking up a different biscuit within a shop, whether that it was possible to change the world that way, and about whether they felt that consumers within Britain should feel responsible for people within developing countries. I think these linked lessons, the kids absolutely love them because they're going away looking forward to the next lesson, which isn't specifically geography, it could be actually citizenship, and it relates directly to what they've just studied about in geography as well, so they're starting to get an idea of the various overlaps. I think it's important for teachers to work together on a topic such as sustainable development because it helps to give the topic that you're covering the maximum amount of curriculum time that it can possibly get. Um, the pupils seem to enjoy it and they're picking up transferable skills and I find it makes my planning um, more thorough but also more enjoyable by working with Matt. We've developed a very close relationship between the subjects and it helps us to work as a team. I think a geography teacher's role in teaching sustainable development is what I got into teaching for basically, to make sure that we are making the world a better place and looking at how our actions are having massive implications for the world at this time. Ultimately if we didn't teach the students about sustainable development, I feel that they would continue to walk into shops and perhaps not consider other, other aspects um, which might influence their decision, they would simply not be aware of them. So I think it's a vital subject and ultimately I hope that it will empower pupils to make the choice to change the world. Mm -hmm.